We go to the Brian Foley Law Hotline, and that's where we find Tom Hart of the SEC Network and ESPN. Tom, good morning, buddy. Good morning. Um, yeah, chaos is probably the proper word to describe everything in college athletics over the weekend, not just the football, but a lot of upsets in the college basketball side, too. Yeah, it's, so, Tom, look, I, I, they probably got the right four teams. I don't know. I just... This is just another time that we can complain about the system being flawed. And, oh, by the way, it'll look different next year. But for right now, it just sucks, man. Like, I don't know what the right answer is, but this ain't it. Well, there's a lot of issues with it. Um, I think think it's flawed. I think it's unfair. Like you asked a team in a Power 5 conference to do one thing, and that's to go out and win every weekend. And they did that. So to to take that opportunity away from Florida State, I found to be patently unfair. Now, one of the problems in fixing the issue, um, you know, yes, we have next year coming, and that's fine. But there's just so many people to blame, including the ACC itself, when they delayed what would have been a 12-team playoff this year by throwing a hissy fit and trying to get an alliance formed or forming an alliance with two other leagues that, by the way, only lasted about 10 months. It didn't got shut down when the Big Ten went against that alliance by stealing teams from the Pac-12. So, uh, you know, it, it put... I know that committee tries really hard, I, I think, and, and they're good people, but it put the committee in an unenviable position of trying to sort this out. And their reasoning left a lot to be desired because if it's the four best teams or if you're saying as Blue Corrigan did, um, you know, part of our decision making was based on with the coaches in the room, who would you least like to face? Well, the answer is Georgia. There's no way you'd rather face Georgia over Texas, for example. And I think Texas is getting off scot free in a lot of these discussions being a a team of the loss just because they'd be, Alabama head to head, um, but yeah, there's there's a lot wrong with the process, um, and I think there's some there's holes in accountability when it comes to this. You send one guy out to answer questions, and he gets uh, you know he gets harassed for 24 hours, 36 hours, and then you kind of forget about it. Uh, it it's unfortunate across the board. What do you think about that first matchup, Michigan or the the 1-4, Michigan uh, taking on Alabama, Alabama playing like the number one team in the country. Michigan is the number one team in the country. Just uh, your thoughts on that one. I don't know that Alabama is really playing like the number one team in the country. I think that they've um, their overall talent has allowed them to avoid the lack of an efficient passing game, especially downfield. Um, Allow, it's kind of bailed them out is the way I see it. I mean, Jalen Milrow had seven completions in the first half Saturday. Um, that's, that's usually not going to cut it. Now, this is the same Michigan team that ran the ball 32 consecutive times against Penn State. They're not going to throw the ball if they don't have to. So uh, maybe this turns into a run fest. But um, some of Bama's best plays on Saturday, especially in the fourth quarter, would – uh, came out of the quarterback run game. That can be, at some point, that becomes entirely too predictable to have success against elite opponents. Um, for whatever reason, it wasn't against Georgia. That surprised me a little bit, especially with the number of spies that uh, Georgia committed to, to Milrow. Um, but that being said, I, I just I didn't see Alabama looking like the, uh, an elite team in the, in the Auburn game. And I didn't see them looking like an elite team um, in the passing game. And I know that I'd be nitpicky um, against Georgia. But, but otherwise, I mean, holy smokes, what a, what a fun SEC championship game. What a, what a cool matchup to have those two teams going head-to-head with so much on the line in what turned out to be a playoff game and uh, an elimination game. Well, Tom, after all the drama that Michigan went through, <laughs> you know, Harbaugh's there winning the Big Ten, the number one team, like <laughs> – uh, just for him, poetic, I guess, if you will. Isn't it funny? Isn't it funny that we kind of all of all of the Harbaugh stuff that that has happened 
And now, um, thanks to the selection committee, the, the guy who is under not one, but two NCAA investigations concurrently, and a coaching staff that is stealing signs and creating, you know, just causing espionage. That as of today, that's just totally overlooked in the college football landscape as we prepare for for the best part, what should be the best part of the season in the playoff. I mean, it's amazing. I, I did notice though that their commissioner didn't stick around uh, for long during the trophy presentation. Talking to Tom Hart here on Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner Schulers. All right, how about the other side? And I don't know if poetic is the right word for this one, but Florida State, obviously they won it out of the ACC. The ACC this year had a winning record against the SEC, and the ACC is left out of the college football playoffs. So have they? are they fighting every way out right now? There's nowhere to go. They're nomads. There's nobody that wants them. The, the, the league that makes the most geographic sense has no motivation or inclination to add them. But not only is there a big old roadblock in Gainesville, Florida, but the way, and I was just talking to a senior administrator this weekend and um, in the league, in the SEC, and they said, listen, the way that they've acted has the entire league, if not if not the folks in Birmingham specifically, totally turned off to what Florida State could possibly bring to the table. Maybe, and this is just a thought here, but listen, the ACC did have a good season, especially non-conference. Now, you know, some of their guys that got hurt, like the Duke quarterback cost them some momentum and Clemson being down and some of those tough losses cost them some headlines that they would normally get. Uh, but the ACC had a great non-conference season, especially Florida State's three-touchdown win against the guy who's going to win the Heisman Trophy, Jaden Daniels, and LSU. So perhaps FSU would have been better off spending some of that time instead of complaining and moaning and putting down their league and saying, wow, how great is this league? And promoting the fact that, hey, we're going to be undefeated conference champions of a premier league with great players and great coaches. Instead, they crapped on it for the last three months and said it was, you know, a bunch of bunk. And now they don't get credit for, for winning it. Um, they certainly didn't get any credit for the game against Louisville Saturday night, playing with their third string quarterback, which, you know, it, here's the other thing about leaving, leaving Florida state out. And, and I do, I do think that they deserve empathy here. They weren't going to be playing with their third string quarterback in the playoff. Number one, and they're going to get Rodemaker back, and and second string is already always better than third string. But to guess, and and they went undefeated with their backup quarterback, including a road win at an SEC school in Florida. Um, so I think there's some some unfairness there, but the it really boils down to this, and and this is tied into the FSU backup quarterback prognostications of how they're going to play and if they're going to be any good with them. It's that the committee should not be in the business of projecting. The committee should be in the business of judging. These are the results. Here's who you beat. Here's how you did it. Here's how your resume stacks up against the next one. Not, oh, what would the point spread be? What would Vegas think in situation? Vegas was wrong, by the way, on all of the major conference championship games this weekend. So I, I don't want to hear, well, so-and-so would be a five-point favorite on a neutral field against, you know, Team B. That's a bunch of bunk. This is, this is college sports. This is totally unpredictable. The players are unpredictable and inconsistent. The coaching is inconsistent week to week. So, uh, by the way, that's another lesson for all you out there. That's, that's why you don't get rich gambling in college sports. What about Texas, a team that – escaped some games that would have looked really bad. Houston comes to mind. There were some other ones, K-State. Um, yeah. Yet, they win. I mean, at the at end of the day, they win. They've got one loss on their schedule. And, uh, you know, they, they have they've taken advantage of a, of a semi-good schedule and, and gotten their way into a playoff. I, I give them credit for, like, um, when these things are judged, their loss... Um, was the least damaging in my eyes. Neutral field, last second, you know, in the game the entire time against Oklahoma. Um, that's that's fine. Um, I, I, I still don't think it usurps an undefeated team in a Power 5 conference, but among the losses, that's fine. And the Alabama win 
uh, we think back to that September day, like that they were in control that entire game. That wasn't a, oh, we got a, a fumble on a month punt and we're able to punch it in. No, they were, they deserved that win. They earned it. Um, I think, and I, I know Aggie fans don't want to hear this, but I just think they're in a really good position, A, at the quarterback position, right? What's what's going to happen there? How good is Arch going to be? Is Quinn going to come back? Which I, I, Who knows what's going to happen there? But Sark has built, and he did this three and four years ago, um, when the move to the SEC was evident, he started building from the inside out, and he recognized the style of play. And I talked to him about this before, uh, about a year ago, um, before the bowl game in San Antonio against Washington. The style of play in the Big 12, which is kind of all gas, no breaks. You can have a creative defense, but you don't have to have a dominating defense. You can be undersized, especially on the defensive side, because you need great speed to keep up with these spread passing attacks. He recognized that that wasn't going to happen, and they had to get bigger on the defensive line and on the offensive line. And he built inside out, and I think they're in they're really in great position, regardless of what happens, um, you know, January first. They're in great position to enter the the SEC with a lot of strengths and and built in the right way with a very strong foundation. Talking to Tom Hart here on the Brian Foley Law Hotline, Tex Hags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. All right, Georgia. That one's a hard one, man, because to me, Georgia not only is one of the four best teams in the country, but it just proves if you're going to lose, you better lose early. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, it's a tough pill to swallow, but they're, you know, aside from. It, the odds of them getting in, once we saw the other games play out, and especially Florida State win Saturday night, um, you knew going into that game that that was an elimination game. And I want to swing back to Florida State here for a second. What the committee did, the lasting impact, even though we're going to 12 teams last year, is they, even though – Critics of a 12-team playoff have been blaming a playoff for this. It's really the playoff committee who's accomplished this. They have devalued the regular season, right? Because now losses mean even less. Uh, obviously, in a 12-team playoff, you could be able to get in with a loss, maybe two. Well, if you have a good enough win or you come from the right conference, and it really doesn't matter. Um, I like the fact that the game Saturday at Mercedes-Benz was a de facto elimination game. Um, we'd like our sports to have defined um, winners and losers and uh, when we know something is on the line. And I still think it's enough to be playing for a conference championship. I know that means a lot to players and coaches, uh, but it, it means more when a trip to the playoff is attached to that. Um, Kirby is the ultimate motivator, and he's really good at that stuff. They're going to go in full steam to their bowl game. And um, yeah, from a recruiting standpoint, he's just going to turn it up a notch. Um, that, that they're not going anywhere, even though they missed the playoff this year. Talking to Tom Hart here on Tex Ags Radio. So, Tom, we didn't get the chat last week, but the Mike Elko news happened. Uh, just your thoughts on Elko returning to Texas A&M and uh, what he's trying to build here. Well, I loved what he said. You know, I, I love that he came out and said it you know, now's the time to show it. I, I forget the exact quote, but um, it's not about talking. It's about doing that fits his personality. Um, Mike Elko was in a position, even when he was at A&M where he could afford to be choosy. And, and some coaches, especially at his age, get anxious and they want to jump and when's my opportunity going to come and I better grab this one while I can, you know, he had a, he had the chance to be the head coach at Temple. And he said, why would I, why would I leave? This is after his first year at A&M, if I'm not mistaken, when Jeff Collins took the Georgia Tech job. Well, why leave here when I am on a track for bigger and better than just Temple? And you could make an argument Duke versus Temple, you know, could be even, but what he accomplished at Duke was amazing. And the fact that Texas A&M, uh, once he left, turned into a 500 club under Jimbo. I mean, he... And, and, this, and the most important part, I think, about that hire is that in, in an era where we just saw Ohio State's quarterback going to the portal today, 
I mean, that's that's astounding, especially because he threw for a ton of yards. Um, he was really good at that position. In this era of talent retention being one of the most valuable aspects that a coach can bring to the table, the fact that they're reintroducing a guy to that to that building where people know him, the players are excited to play for him, and they vouch for him, that is incredibly valuable. So how important are these next couple of days, weeks here for, for Elko? Because obviously you guys are starting to get into the portal. Elijah Robinson leaves. He's got to hire a DC and OC. Uh, there, regardless of what has happened over the last 24 hours, there's still enough talent here to do something great if they can get uh, the players to stay, Tom. Yeah, I, I think that's really, really important. It is. I was talking to a basketball coach about this recently, and uh, his sales pitch to his athletic director when it came to how they're going to um, use their NIL money was really simple. And, and anyone who runs their own business knows what I'm about to say. Um, it is m- much more expensive to go out and find a new employee as opposed to retaining your current employees. Uh, you're going to spend five times as much just from a, a small business standpoint, large business standpoint, uh, to get them in, to train them, to find them. It's very expensive. So if you, it's more important to keep your guys than to get new guys. Um, and I, I think that is very important. I'm also curious, and I haven't, I haven't followed it in the last couple of days. Is he bringing his OC from Duke? Or is he's waiting to see if he gets the job? Because I think that would be a very valuable piece. He is still waiting, and uh, I think um, Johns will still he'll be considered. But it's not just him. He may be swinging for a bigger fish, Tom. To be one hundred percent honest. Oh, really? Well, that's the thing. Who are you hearing? He, well, I'm not hearing a name per se, but Billy has reported he's got what eleven million dollars to spend on his assistants. The fact that he hasn't hired one yet means he's still surveying what's out there, and the fact that Tyler Santucci isn't coming over from Duke means you know that was his DC there. He might be bringing in a bigger fish there, uh, offensive coordinator. He can do whatever he wants, right? He and and it, it might be the guy from Duke, right? But. He might be waiting to see, you know, the dude at Oregon and and Will Stein or somebody yeah. else, right? I'm not saying him per se, but that level of coach. It's a great place to be, and by the way, that's why that's why if you're Mike Elko, Elko you um, you played your cards right in your career by knowing your value and knowing which jobs to say no to. Um, listen, we just. Moments ago, we detailed where some other teams in this league are. We didn't even talk about Alabama and being a, a CFP team this year, but Georgia and Kirby and the foundation that Texas has, and they're not slowing down anytime soon. Um, Missouri's playing in a year six. They've got their quarterback coming back and a bunch of pieces coming back next year. Um, so expectations are going to be high there. This is not a league for the timid. Um, I think the Duke offensive coordinator did a fantastic job and would be a great addition and the knowledge base that he has with Elko and the comfortability there. And maybe you get the quarterback as well. Who knows? Um, but the bottom line is it's good to swing for the fences. The problem, I would say this, my hesitation is the only problem with that. Um, and Mississippi state was in a very different situation, obviously with Mike Leach's passing and, and a different situation from, their status in the college football world or what they had to spend on assistance. But they got strung along in the coordinator hiring process when Zach Arnett got the job last December. They didn't hire a guy until late. They didn't get their first choice. Their offense was a total disaster, and they never got it going. So um, timeliness does does have importance in this process, especially if if you get burned or you miss out on your on your first choice or the guy that you think is the home run higher. Tom, I'm looking through some of these upsets over the weekend, man. Make sense of it in college basketball. I mean, you got Duke falling to Georgia Tech. Uh, there were several other games out there. Where you, like Kentucky falls to UMC Wilmington. Uh, what what'd you think of this entire weekend? Yeah, just total chaos. Uh, Auburn lost on the road yesterday to Appalachian State. Mississippi State was was ranked. They had a, a great start to the season. They lost twice this week. Understandable that they lost uh, on the road at Georgia Tech, but then they lost at home to Southern yesterday. Uh, Arkansas, after that huge win against Duke in the midweek in the challenge, 
loss at home in a game that they should have won. Um, college basketball, I think going forward, is going to be unpredictable, just the nature of it because of the, the portal and guys getting minutes together and learning each other and being brand new teams. But it was, um, it was not a good weekend for the SEC. The challenge was okay. They split the challenge. Kentucky's win against Miami really put Kentucky in the driver's seat just from a, a perception standpoint because they show that they're as talented as we think they are. Um, and then that fell apart with the loss to UNC Wilmington where they had one guy go for like 35 and as a team they buried a bunch of threes. Kentucky didn't shoot it well. Same thing for Arkansas. They had incredible momentum. That building was as loud as it's ever been in their win against Duke. Now, Duke lost again, so they're not the same Duke program. Um, but you, as a league, you've got to hold on to that momentum. Um, Missouri's got a 300-plus loss to Jackson State at home. The concern is, like, let's compare this to football. It didn't really hurt football because Alabama got in. But the concern is if you don't have a good non-conference not only does the perception hurt you when it comes to voters, but the net uh, release just came out today with the rankings. Uh, the numbers don't like bad losses. And those hang over your head come Selection Sunday, no matter what happens in your league, unless you have like five teams just beat the snot out of everybody else. But that will limit the number of teams you get in. So um, I think the chaos Outside of the SEC, probably makes it a, a little bit more bearable. But overall, some some bad losses that are going to be impactful based on how they influence the numbers, not just for the teams that lost those games, but for their conference opponents going forward. Tom, I'll close with this. A&M basketball needed the weekend off. They had played so many games, especially on the road. Uh, still dealing with some injuries out there. Just uh, They're a team, though. You know, they get better as the year goes on. All those buzz teams do. Every single one of them. And the beauty of it is um, there are some knowns with A&M, but there's also plenty of unknowns, just like any other program. His willingness and ability to make adjustments during a season are second to none. Mm -hmm. Uh, He had a team at Virginia Tech where he was married to this one defensive philosophy. They lost, I think it was on on a Tuesday night, on Wednesday, they completely revamped their defensive philosophy. They changed everything, and they introduced it that next Saturday. They went on a run. They had and they had a great season. Ended up making the tournament. Uh, very few coaches are willing to do that, but it's it's important to be flexible in this day and age because you have to learn more about your team and your individuals at an accelerated pace than you ever were allowed to do before. Jay Williams likes to tell the story about Mike Krzyzewski. He's like, I don't think he knew my name as a freshman. Because Coach Shea didn't need to know freshman. Because he wasn't going to play a freshman. So you earn an opportunity to get on the floor, then he'll learn who you are and how you fit into the team. But you're going to be doing it against a bunch of upperclassmen. Even the upperclassmen are new in college hoops. Um, so that learning process has to get accelerated. And you have to be flexible enough at one point to say, you know what, what we thought was going to work? It's not working. I'm not going to be stubborn about it. We're going to change what we do so we can be successful. And that's what makes Buzz a great coach. Tom, we appreciate it, sir. Thanks so much, man. Always great. Thanks, dude. Later, buddy.